you need are basically for there to be a, a preponderance of good rock bands is you need basically a lot of males between the age of 17 to 22 who are smart but at the same time kind of lazy because they don't want a job so they buy a lot of instruments and they get good at them and they basically before they move on to the rest of their life they spend three years writing songs instead of like you know you know, working for the newspaper or working for like, you know, the bank or whatever, you know, they, they, they put that time into it. Rock and roll isn't considered necessarily high art, but it's probably looked at as the highest form of art that's very easily accessible. Rock and roll has always been accessible. As a matter of fact, if you were a kid growing up in the 1970s, chances are you really believed if you had enough money for an amp and a guitar, you could lead a revolution. By 1977, Akron had already spawned famous groups like Devo, The Waitresses, and The Rubber City Rebels. And by 1979, all those bands had left town for the bright lights of the big city. So there was this suddenly excitement about Akron's rock scene, but there were no bands left. And so what happened is other bands began to form with a completely different idea of what would happen to them. And so when Unit 5 formed and Hammer Damage formed and, and the Hi-Fis and some other bands that formed around the beginning of the 1980s, they had the example that you get a great big record contract handed to you and something good is going to happen. Something good did happen here in downtown Akron, but it just wasn't exactly what we expected. Growing up in the Rubber City meant you got used to mustard-colored clouds that smelled like sulfur, and Christmas always meant going to your dad's factory to get an album of holiday music from the company. But somehow, the bands that came from Akron captured that sense of prosperity clouded by doom in their music, and it made for something more than just another three-minute pop song, something lasting. I believe there's a, there's a common thread in, in the Akron sound, what we used to call the Akron sound. And it's, I believe it's carried on through all of the bands that have, have fallen through from the early days, from the mid-80s and, and late 70s. You know, bands like Hammer Damage and Rubber City Rebels, who, who paved the road for all of us. The Akron scene was just an amazing thing in the early 80s. Akron's first rock scene in the 1970s saw the Rubber City Rebels going from playing for small crowds in Akron's biker bars to going on national tours to promote an album on Capitol Records. Devo went from playing a rubber workers hangout called The Crypt with just a handful of friends in attendance to playing with David Bowie in New York City. By 1979, Akron was being called the New Liverpool, and those early bands looked like they were on their way out of The Crypt and on to rock star. What followed was a scene that had a much higher profile and needed a bigger club, and so, in sort of the crypt tradition, all the bands took over a bigger place. Just like the scene at the crypt, Akron's second wave of bands would take over a relic from another generation and remake it, as the city struggled with the loss of thousands of jobs as rubber factories closed their doors and left town. Now, maybe it was because they were left with no hope for a lifetime job in a factory, or maybe it was because they hoped to avoid a lifetime in the factory. Many of Akron's young people turned to rock and roll as a way out. Let's just go all night. Rich Roberts, Sue Schmidt, and Deb Smith formed Chai Pig in 1978, taking their name from the sign at a local restaurant. Smith and Schmidt had already played together at Akron's Firestone High School as teens in a band called the Poor Girls. They had also befriended Chrissy Hind, another Firestone student who would go on to form the Pretenders in London. Drummer Rich Roberts recalls spending his musically formative years surrounded by experimentation, rooming with future Devo drummer Alan Myers. We had been doing musical experimentation at all hours of day and night. We had two drum sets. The living room was the music room. We had two drum sets, a B3 organ, uh, various percussion instruments, guitars, amps. Ralph Carney came over and played sax. Dan Clayman came over and played keyboards. We had a vibraphone. 
we had a set of tabla drums. So it, and we were all listening to a lot of jazz. So it was complete free form, creative music flowing all the time. Oh, my After forming Chai Pig, one of the band's first public gigs was as an opening act for Akron's Tin Huey at a bar called JB's in Kent. On the very night that Tin Huey, one of that first wave of Akron bands, was being scouted by legendary Atlantic Records label executive Jerry Wexler. To have, uh, God, was it maybe Jerry Wexler and Karen Berg from Warner Brothers in Kent, Ohio, downstairs at JB's, unheard of. So the room was packed, lots of energy for them, and we were able to sort of glom onto it and feel it. The band started to play, and Chai Pig unveiled their quirky, offbeat brand of music. I felt a, a familiarity musically with Rich and Sue that I'd never experienced before. I had that feeling at the very first show. I did. There was, there was, that was a, a wonderful night. We weren't like the Go-Go's or, you know, the Bangles, but we were, you know, a band that was funded by two women. Um, and we, and we, I guess we're sort of silly. Unit 5 was like the quintessential Akron new wave band. They looked and sounded like a new wave band. They were, they were professional, they were polished, they, and I think that they, um, of anybody, they were certain that they were going to be rock stars. Unit 5's future lead singer Tracy Thomas worked in an Akron area record store with future drummer Bob Ethington. And although the two liked each other, they didn't see eye to eye musically. Tracy at the time, as I recall, was kind of into Linda Ronstead in America. I like to remind her of these things now. And uh, was kind of pursuing that. And she asked me to play drums with her, which I did like one afternoon in her garage. And I didn't really like the music that much, but you know, it was kind of fun. It's true that I used to have very bad taste in music. I would think, <laughs> I would think that I'm over it. I think I'm over it. At the record store, lead singer Tracy Thomas and Bob Ethington talked about music and where they wanted to go with their careers. She called me one day out of the blue and said that she was starting this band with this guy named Mark and that they were really into Devo and they were trying to kind of move in that direction. I fancied myself a singer so I approached Mark and I'm like, you know, I think I can sing, blah, blah, blah. And next thing you know, you know, we were jamming and that was it. I'd, I'd found my calling, I thought. I will say this about the record store there. Those are, those are the glory days. I mean, the, the days of vinyl and we had this import section with all these strange, weird, yeah. pink and green cool. vinyl, 10 inch vinyl records coming over from England of these punk bands that we'd never heard of. And we'd sit there and stare at them, you know, and figure out what does this sound like, you know? And it was real inspiring, actually. I mean, and we the, got first dibs on posters and the demo albums. Yeah. Yeah, I got to hear a lot of cool music. Paul Augie Teagle grew up in Akron's blue collar Kenmore area. And just like his father, he also worked for a rubber factory. The rubber factories had a lot to do with it. I mean, you, they were the focus of Akron when I was growing up. You know, it was all about, you couldn't get away from rubber factories. It was just, it was in, you know, ingrained in you, and uh, you know, I think people on the weekends like to tend to booze it up, and uh, you know, music was a good outlet for all of that. When we first got together, it was at this weird little creepy farm-like 
dungeon place off a Talmadge circle <laughs> that um, Mark Gendersack inhabited along with a lot of dirty dishes and his, his roommate who was a maniac as well and we uh, uh, started practicing then my major memories of it were that it was just like stiflingly hot you know like always like 200 degrees and if you wanted a drink of water you had to find <laughs> something that you could drink out of <laughs> I mean you know it was like really it was really gross despite his distaste for dirty dishes Ethington and the band got down to practicing and the band Gel. And it was just like instantly we had the sound. Like I think I felt like that that night. It was like this is it. But Unit 5 didn't want to just play the hits, covering top 40 songs like so many other bands. We had a strong inclination and in, in belief in trying to be original and trying to, you know, and definitely doing our, our own stuff. But what helps with that is, is the fact that there were clubs that we could play. There were they, they were letting original music bands play. There was the Bank. There was the Robin Hood out in Kent. There was JB's. Uh, a number of other clubs. I get I, ultimately. I, I just always knew we were gonna we were gonna approach our own. We wanted to do our own music, and we knew that we had an outlet to do it. So. The whole punk thing appealed to me because it was people doing, doing their own thing. You know, uh, it wasn't polished. It wasn't rehearsed. A lot of it was spur of the moment. You could say, you know, you and nobody cared, and it was fun. You know, they probably would slap you on the back and go, "Yeah, right on." You know, dump beer over yourself, roll on the floor, get glass, you know, cuts, and you know. <laughs> Nihilistic, I guess, it was what I liked about all of that. Armed with a sound that the band referred to as dark pop, Unit 5's dark lyrics and goofy stage show caught on in Akron, and soon they would find fans far outside the rubber city. Good way to get away from, you know, having a job and having to wear a tie and being conservative and, you know, it was just a lot of fun. So that's basically why I did it. I was in it for the fun. sounded like a rock band and they looked like a big stadium rock and roll band of some sort and they acted like it and they were they were great I was in a band playing out in uh, Portage Lakes a place called the Magic Bus and um, with uh, Rod Firestone and Buzz Click we were called King Cobra and Scott was in the band at the time, and we had Mark Mothersbaugh was our sound man, and our keyboard. He'd mix the sound with his right hand, play keyboards with his left, and then that band turned into Rubber City Rebels. They were just a real high energy club rock band. By 1976, King Cobra had become the Rubber City Rebels, and just like many of the first wave of the Akron bands, the Rebels signed a national recording contract. But Donnie Damage and Mike Hammer didn't want to make the move to L.A. with the rest of the Rebels. They wanted to come back home to Akron. When they did, it didn't take long for them to start putting together a new band. By 1979, Donnie Damage and Mike Hammer were joined by bassist Scott Winkler and guitarist George Cabanis with small ambitions at first. I think the whole point of us getting together originally, yeah. like two, two nights at JB's maybe, and I really don't remember much about it except that I don't think we were that good <laughs> you know we were just okay i remember we were the rebels were playing uh, opening up for the new york dolls at the cleveland agora and um uh, i think um i don't know i don't know i can't remember exactly what happened but that's kind of when buzz and rod went back to la and mikey uh, and i stayed here and then boom and then damage <laughs> composed 
of seasoned players, hammer damage found its groove early on, and Donnie Damage would often serve as the master of ceremonies at the band's raucous concerts. A lot of chemistry. You know, everybody is quite proficient on their instrument, especially George and Scott and Mike. Just really solid, you know, I mean, really. And uh, I always like to horse around a lot, you know, and clown around and cut up, and uh, a lot of fun to go on a trip with. <laughs> Already experienced in songwriting from their time with the Rebels, Hammer Damage hurled themselves into a frenzy of creativity. You know, they, every song we did seemed to really go when we play. We started playing out. You know, the, the market was pretty set for it, too, I think, because, uh, the, you know, a lot of the other bands had gone to other parts of this country. We, we basically decided to stay here. We could have easily also went, but we decided to stay here because we found that it helped us to hone our craft, and uh, we eventually broke out a little bit, too. You know? But even though some bars allowed bands to play original music, it still required a lot of work. To play original music, you'd end up going to Painesville. Um, there is a place called, I think, the Fantasy Nightclub out in Painesville, and then you'd have to go down to New Philadelphia because they would have, uh, you know, let, let original bands play, and then to Kent, and then to Cleveland. So it wasn't like you were just walking down Main Street and able to go from club to club. You uh, still had to had to search out the places that would let you play. Soon, Hammer Damage would be playing four nights a week and drawing hundreds every night. It was obvious the record companies couldn't stay away from a sure thing like this for long, especially given Akron's track record with producing Devo, The Waitresses, Chrissy Hind, and others. And Hammer Damage was ready to make their mark on rock music. Well, yeah, because then you know it can be done. You know, so naturally you want to do it too. Like, well, these guys got signed, so we could get signed, you know. It made it obvious that it could happen, you know. As long as rock music is the kind of the dominant musical idiom, there's going to be people who are going to want to say to themselves, like, I want to do this and see if I can, you know, contribute something or succeed somehow. You know, I mean, it's always been a tradition of rock and roll that you see some band and you go, hey, I can, I can probably do that. And you get a guitar and you, you start playing it and you find out you can do that. You know, these guys just sort of was a moment in time when there was 10 or 12 bands in town that all came upon, upon that at the same time. But even though the bands were all vying for record contracts, one thing about Akron's scene that was different than the big cities, in Akron, bands could compete without really being against each other. It was very unique that there was that much collegiality and not a lot of infighting when everybody is going for the same donut. But I guess we were still coming out of the mentality that there were, there were dozens of donuts. Little did we know, you know, Krispy Kreme was going out of business. One of the biggest players in the Akron rock scene was about to rear its head, and the bands in Akron's second wave would have no choice but to play along. It was late 1979, and what the Akron rock scene needed now was another place like the Crypt, a dive, preferably, where bands could take over and do their own thing. And they got it in the form of an empty bank right on Akron's once bustling Main Street, which by now was deserted. It was like this complete reclamation of, you know, it was almost like, you know, something from Planet of the Apes where it was left behind from a previous culture, which literally it was because downtown was collapsing at the time and there was no need for this, um, this kind of like over the top bank building. The biggest player in the Akron rock scene of the early 1980s was actually a jazz fan. An Akron attorney named Howard Allison bought an old hotel on Akron's Main Street that had a bank on the Main Street entrance. And he didn't know what to do with it. And he's, he's like, well, I like jazz. I'll book jazz into this club. And it suddenly finds himself a bar owner. He wasn't too happy about it. In the true Midwestern utilitarian way of Akron, the old bank that became a nightclub was simply called The Bank. And it, along with JB's in Kent, would become the hub of local rock music in the 1980s. It was 
1980, I'd hit the bank on Main Street, JB's out in Kent every Thursday. Every week I was, I was seeing Hammer Damage or one of those other bands. The bank was all. <laughs> the sound sucked, the people were great. Everything about the bank was, it wasn't the, it wasn't the venue itself, it was the, the, the aura, the feeling of being there. Energetic, it was fun. The bank was was big, and it was stately. I mean, upstairs, the 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 uh, the bathrooms were the nicest bathrooms you would ever want to see in a in a rock club, they, they were marble and the urinals were sort of sculpture. And even though somebody, you know, like broke some of the marble and they wrote on it and it smelled, I, there was a balcony there that um, I heard people would smoke marijuana up there. And you could, this is the first time I'd ever smelled it. I was like underage and I would sneak in and I always wondered, you know, like what, what why the upstairs of the bank had that smell. I thought it was clove cigarettes or something. And uh, somebody pulled me aside one night and told me what it was. I thought, oh, how did they get away with that? It didn't make sense that you could do something illegal in public. Very quickly, the bank stage became home to Hammer Damage, Unit 5, Chai Pig, and other bands. The Cavernous Club could hold hundreds, and often did, like a time in 1979 when a triumphant Tin Huey returned to Akron for a concert after completing their first album for Warner Brothers Records. A shaky new band called Unit 5 opened for them. The bank was packed. I mean, it was, I don't know how many people were there, but it was so energetic and fun. And this was the first time I'd ever played in front of any number of people like that. And, and I was really nervous. And at the bank, the stage was really high. And the drum area was like even higher. And it had about three inches behind you, which then went back into this like about a 15 foot drop <laughs> where you, you, know, you could almost imagine vermin living, you know, and maybe like some sort of hobo <laughs> on the loose down there, you know, and it was just like, I'm like, you know, I'm like, I'm scared to death I'm going to die. I'm scared to death of all these people out here, but man, this is fun. And I was like just shaking, so I started dancing just to loosen up a little bit, and you know, it was like the next thing I knew, you know, it was like people were, <laughs> it was just, it I, I, you know, it was like immediately you had this great feeling, you know, that uh, I was somehow getting through to people, and it, it was, you know, uh, amazing to me. I was just totally shocked and awed by the whole thing, and, uh, you know, a, a feeling like that, it's, it's hard to replace, so I kept at it for numerous years just to kind of keep that buzz going. If you were a drummer, that riser in the bank probably still causes you nightmares. But there'd be this little part of your mind that would always make sure that your throne wasn't creeping back while you were playing. Before you stop and stand up, you think, remember, <laughs> it's back there. Don't step backwards. Just one more step back. <laughs> we would just put on these shows, these lavish shows, three or four bands a night, and there's a big um, parachute there in the middle of the, uh, this ba old bank and uh, soaked up a lot of the bad sound. and. Uh, it was just like I say. It was we tried to create a happening. All the bands together. I don't remember any dissension of any type. We all got along fabulously. Because the bank was the, the greatest place to play. It was huge. You could get six, seven hundred people in there routinely. There were crowds nearly that big. Uh, had a dressing room downstairs. It was ratty, but it was still a dressing room. Felt cool. There was this big balcony that was kind of open air in the back. Which people had, routinely fell from or jumped from. Yeah, right. Well, because to flee our music, I think. <laughs> High energy, uh, full house all the time. Packed. The floor was packed. You had to like the pogo. <laughs> The clothes were crazy. It was fun to see what people were wearing. That was a good kind of uh, energetic crowd. They weren't um, 
trying to be violent, they were just having fun and being silly. flyer from uh, the bank that just blatantly said, come to uh, Thursday nights, free mixed drinks, free beer. That was a marketing ploy that definitely got people in there. It doesn't matter who you are. I don't, don't Where sometimes we'd pull members from other bands on stage and the feeling in that room was so wonderful because it was it was like a big party in a big city in a hot club and you knew that the people who were there were there in support of the people who were on stage the the music was had a lot of energy and you could tell that they enjoyed playing it they were good performers and it was just a good time a lot of energy So you don't know where it's going to go. And once she had her 150-foot mic cord so that she could leave the club and pull people in from other clubs <laughs> to come and do this, I mean, it was just wonderful. In the night, when it's not bright, when the sun don't shine. And we would go see them, my brother and I would go see them every night. If we got grounded for being out past curfew, we would sneak out the front window and roll the car down the driveway into the street and then start it in the street so we wouldn't wake our parents and sneak out to go to the bank. And that was the most, some of the most exciting nights of my life. I have one guy who came up one night, he had his whole, his, all his ears were covered in blood and they were dripping. He had his whole ears with uh, safety pins. And you know, nowadays if someone was dripping blood like that, you'd, you know, you'd be Bleh. Back in those days, it was like, cool, let me have some of that, man, cool. By 1980, the bank played host to Unit 5, Hammer Damage, Chai Pig, the F Models, the Action, and a host of other local bands. And it definitely looked like the record labels couldn't stay away for long, not with the huge crowds the bands were drawing. If you're talking about a local club show in Akron, Ohio, and a thousand people showed up for a show, or even 500 people, that's a huge number of people for a local band to draw. Maybe the record labels would swoop in again and make everybody else rich. But in the meantime, the bank was a happening place, and the bands and their fans were having a blast. I guess it didn't matter to us, to young people, whether there was a record contract on the horizon for any of these bands or whether they were going to be something bigger because they had already accomplished it. They were doing the thing that music is supposed to do. They were making somebody feel joy. The feeling of support and encouragement uh, with those bands is really hard to describe, but nobody was worried about there not being enough for everybody. And that's a very different state of mind than I think the music industry is in now. More of a scarcity mentality. There was, there was no scarcity mentality. The world was our oyster. When any band is drawing hundreds of people every night of the week, it doesn't take long for a local band to become a regional favorite, which started to happen for Unit 5, Hammer Damage, and Chai Pig. And then they started getting calls to open for big name acts that came through town. We, you know, played for the B-52s and a bat, a real, the real King Bees back in the day and Public Image Limited with Johnny Rotten and all that. We had some really cool jobs, you know, and uh, 
I always just felt, you know, uh, one day somebody's going to come up and say, you know, I, I think I could do something for you. Hammer damage weren't the only ones playing to ever larger houses. Unit 5 was finding that their star was rising too. You know, they were doing showcase gigs in New York and, and they were sort of being trotted in front of record companies. And obviously, of course, they were going to become rock stars because the same thing had happened to, to all of the bands that had come shortly before them. And it was just a matter of time. Very quickly, we were thinking like, well, you know, we're all going to be famous. You know, our band's going to be famous, and these other bands are going to be famous, because look at all these people that are here, and they all love us, and we're doing our own stuff, and it's just a matter of time, you know. It's just a matter of time. For Chai Pig, their fame had landed them showcases in the big city, and a special trip to one of the country's biggest recording studios, Criteria Studios in Florida. Miami. It was the best. I mean, it was it was it was just the dream, you know. We're down there. We're living on the beach in this little, you know, hotel, which is I'm sure long gone. Little pool in the in the center of this, you know, two-story, um, funky, deco old thing. And we could come back from the studio at like six o'clock in the morning and just like walk out into the beach. We got to record in a professional studio, even though we've been doing recording on our own. We were on the road for a more extended period of time. We got to play dates in warm weather, wonderful warm weather, when it was fall here. It didn't really matter that we didn't, you know, weren't like, hadn't arrived yet. It felt like it, you know. We were playing. I mean, we were playing, we were just living our music. We reached this level of of just enough success that was really cool, you know? I mean, we, we had a great following locally. We played all the time. We played in New York City at Danceteria and the Hurrah Club. These were like the coolest clubs at the time. Uh, got written about in the New York Times, Village Voice, you know, there was press about us. Always felt like there was a lot of potential there. It wasn't that the bands had crazy expectations. After all, it wasn't even a year before that Tin Huey, Devo, the Bizarros, and the Rubber City Rebels had all signed national recording contracts. There was still a lot of buzz and hype surrounding Akron's status as the new Liverpool, another industrial town just like the one where British kids picked up guitars to escape the fate of their fathers in the factories and became stars. Initially, we hit it right at its hottest. But through the course of our being together, it did start to wane a little. I mean, at one point, there was a contest in England, and this guy ended up in my house because he won a trip to Akron, and he came to my house to meet me. And at that point, I thought, this is wild. This guy is here, he's from England, he won a contest to come here and sit in my living room. That was before there was corporate ownership record labels. So that was when there were still Jerry Wexlers that would come and hear bands, you know. Um, so that was shifting. At the same time, we're saying, okay, you know, this next one, this next one. And there was a lot of that going on. Everybody was sort of waiting for, to, to be noticed in a, in a bigger way. The bands got noticed. They recorded albums. They played showcases in New York, LA, and Miami. And then, nothing. And what started to happen is a few years into these bands' careers, they weren't getting the record contracts thrown at them. And the talent scouts weren't swarming around Akron like they had been do doing a few years before. And I think there was this sort of growing subtle disappointment um, among that scene that it wasn't quite happening the way it seemed like it had been scripted. That hot period was probably no more than a year and it probably was more like nine months or so and you know but we kept 
moving on that impetus and if, uh, uh, for several years afterwards. I would think that with every band, plan A is to be a rock star. And if that doesn't work out, plan B is C plan A because you're going to be a rock star. I guess there, there's something that happens where you reach the trajectory of your possibility and you know opportunity doesn't completely happen and and then you start to decline without having kind of gotten everything that you had hoped for there's something that happens to a person I think that um, they don't want to admit that they're on their way back down and and so they have the choice of either sort of gracefully making an exit or hanging on a little bit too long you know both are viable options and anybody who loves playing music there's there's nothing wrong with continuing to play it but there is something about the excitement of being headed toward your possibility that's much more beautiful than being past your prime. Most of the bands still had day jobs. The late nights in the clubs and early mornings began to collide. And as time wore on and the 80s advanced, the glory days of playing the bank and going out for dinner at 3 a.m. were starting to wear a bit thin. You'd be sitting there, and here I was, and with my, you know, white shirt and skinny tie, and you know, and then over like in the corner booth, there'd be these two metal guys with feathered hair, and you the know, drag queens. and then you kind of look over in the All other the corner, queens. and there'd be like, you know, these guys like in sort of plaid suits and stuff, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking like, and I'm thinking like, well, no, I'm thinking like with this guy, these are the wedding band guys, and this is the top 40 metal guys, and here we are, we're kind of not into each other, like a bunch of like you know, divorced dads or something with their kids on the holidays thinking like, <laughs> I know why we're all here. Yeah, because we, we're musicians. That's why we're the only ones that are still awake, except for this poor schmuck that's making our taco. I mean, so it was just like, you know, it, it really got to that point where it was like, you know, things like sleep and <laughs> livelihood it became started important. It became more important. Yeah. Now, people that are successful in the music business are few and far between. I just always wanted to do my own thing. That was it. <laughs> I can't I can't explain it. But I but I know that I felt like it should have happened and it didn't, you know. And I think we all got a, a I I think that we did get a little discouraged at some point because it didn't. The stress of the constant traveling and the lack of recording contracts started to fracture some of the once friendly relationships in the bands. I had, like I said, these fantasies, you know, and I, 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 my expectations, I wanted them to be fulfilled right now, and I, a lot of times I, I didn't get them fulfilled right now, so then I would throw little fits, and I'm sorry, George. That's okay. <laughs> Finally, the second wave for Akron's rock bands came crashing down. When the band closed, that meant the scene really shifted away from Akron. It went to Kent, and JB's was a much smaller place. It was packed, we, we would pack it, but it was a much different atmosphere, and that's where we kept playing all the time, you know, week in, week out, and it, that was also where, after a while, it began to get a little, a little tiresome. We, we burned ourselves out. For the members of Unit 5, the grind and the late nights were getting old, and their album, Scared of the Dark, didn't seem to be getting much attention outside of Northeast Ohio. Finally, after one night at JB's, Unit 5 had just had enough. Having played JB's two nights in a row, hauling the equipment up the urine-covered cement stairs from the basement after having gotten into words with the sort of biker clientele from upstairs, and uh, and and it, I remember it was like this night in the middle of winter, and I was trying to knock the ice off my window, and and I and I hit the rearview outside rearview mirror, and it just cracked off from the cold, you know, and I'm like this. I, this is, I, I, you know, how much longer am I going to have to do this? Soon after, Unit 5 met for one last time. I was so sad. I mean, I actually cried. I remember you guys going, don't cry, don't cry. But we, we had just moved on. We had, it had run its course. In retrospect, maybe we should have taken a break, you know, and thought about it and then come back and maybe try to do another studio album to uh, 
make up for the one that didn't turn out exactly how it should have. But, you know, you're young and, and you think it's over and, and it might not have been, but you know, we'll never know. It's a decision I've rethought many times over the years. Either should we have gone that extra step, or maybe just realistically, should we have kept playing together? It was you know, a little premature. You know, it was probably it was yeah, premature it, looking back. Yeah, it was probably a mistake. But like I said, it was that kind of combination of this overweening ambition being hit by reality. I guess my biggest regret was that we didn't pursue it. So that's that. Despite having recorded an album that they loved, Chai Pig was also not finding a lot of interest outside of Northeast Ohio. I remember being a little bit tired of, you know, sleeping on yet one more mattress on somebody's floor somewhere and thinking, this is not, this is not Miami. <laughs> For Hammer Damage, there would be no album. Just a single and an EP, recorded material that left only a faint trace of the once vital rock band. After guitarist George Cabanis left the band to join the Dead Boys, the group tried to soldier on with Iggy Morningstar in his place. But it just wasn't the same. I guess if I hadn't quit the band, that could have uh, changed things. But uh, I got an offer to play with Stiv Baders and the Dead Boys. and. Uh, kind of agonized over it for weeks and decided I had to go for it. Before the end of the 80s, nearly all of the second wave of Akron bands had called it quits. Nobody had made it big. There were no national contracts. It's not just what you can do in this space, it's what you can do in this space, you know? And uh, I mean, certainly a lot of those bands from that period in Akron only operate in this space. But I mean, you know, I, I that makes them less successful, but only less commercially successful, you know? I mean, it, it, from a fan's perspective, from your perspective, that I, I, I would think that, that the Rubber City Rebels and the Ramones would be equally successful. The only people who don't seem to agree with you are people who haven't heard the former. Becoming a rock star is like winning the lottery. You just got to decide on how much you want to play and how much money you want to spend trying to get those lottery tickets that makes people both proud and angry at the same time. It's like they're happy about the fact that there's an experience of living in Akron that is unlike anywhere else. And that there's certain iconography with the city, like with the rubber industry and the soapbox derby and like its relationship to these very specific bands like Devo and the Pretenders and people always bring those things up. You know, but then there's also sort of this distaste with the idea that this did not become some kind of national phenomenon. Like, like they want something to themselves that's independent, but they want the world to share it. It's very unique. For fans of the bands, the time left an indelible mark. It's unfortunate that they didn't get to make it big because it's years later and I'm, I'm still enjoying it as much as I always did. And there's a lot of bands I see, but I still like those ones I was seeing back then. Kind of changed my personality. <laughs> I went from a shy, subdued person to a, to a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> a rubber city rebel. When you look at the bands from that period of Akron that didn't do anything and that it's a shared experience for you and 400 other people, I mean, that should make you happier. It shouldn't make you upset. <laughs> The 80s were over, and in the 90s, pop music and hip-hop ruled the charts. But after a while, fans of punk and new wave started looking backward to the music of their youth. They found each other online to swap rare recordings of the bands from their days at the bank. A few years back, we were all getting hounded by record collectors looking for the Hammer Damage 45, which is you know, pretty rare. We probably didn't make more than well, a, a thousand, maybe. So I had guys calling me from Germany and England and California, you know, trying to buy it. And um, you did too, I think. Well, George, I thought George was calling me up acting like using his German accent with me when this guy named Klaus or somebody called me, called me by my AKA and that. I was like, how'd you get my phone number, dude? He's calling me from like uh, Wiener Schnitzel or somewhere. I don't know where it was, but. You know, wonder if we had any records or any new records or what's been going on. You get on the internet, just dial hammer damage on, on your computer and it'll pop right up. I don't, uh, you don't even have to put dot com, you know, it's pretty strange. Members of Chai Pig kept getting emails from fans asking where they could get a CD version of the old Miami album. And 
finally, the band decided to oblige. I almost can't remember how I felt before all of this kind of resurgence because I remember just not thinking about it, thinking that was over and done with and it was a part of my life that was over and you know even though we still knew each other we didn't see each other much um, but I, I think it's it's been so invigorating and fulfilling and rewarding to be able to do it again and to be able to have this CD. I mean I just enjoyed actually listening to it. What sparked this renewed interest in punk and new wave music from the early 80s? Well, nostalgia can't be ruled out. But some band members think the state of today's music business has a part in it, too. It was maybe the last time when not all of radio and music was controlled by Clear Channel. You know, you could actually go and buy a different little 45 that some band put out, and it would be totally different from the one next to it on the shelf. We grew up in power of rock and roll and also with big ears listening to all the great R&B artists. I think that it has, it has an elemental, basic, legitimate, authentic power to it that transcends time. And, and I, that sounds as pretentious as all get out, I know, but I'm as surprised as you are. In the early part of the new millennium, the Rubber City Rebels, Tin Huey, the Bizarros, and even Devo started to record new music. By 2004, some of the bands from the second wave were thinking about reforming, playing a couple of gigs, or maybe even recording again. I always felt that in the proper studio, with the proper producer, the tunes could take a whole new, have a whole new life. And, and again, you know, I'm into recreating myself anyway, um, musically all the time, so the songs are the songs are still fresh in some ways. In some ways, they we could put a little, uh, you know, a little uh, new millennium sound to them and make them even ten times better. To their surprise, the bands found that their audience was still out there. In 2005, Hammer Damage reformed with the original lineup for the first time since the 80s to play a gig on Main Street at the Lime Spider and people who had never seen them lined up for the concert. It's history, you hear about hammer damage, you know, you've heard the name for, for ages, dare I say decades, but uh, yeah, of course I'm excited about seeing them. I'm happy to be playing with them too. So. Just curious, I want to see what they're like and see if they'll they live up to a legend. I think they will, from what I've heard. Good zone, hammer damage. <laughs> slamming the door on anything at this stage of the game. The music has a newness to me now um, that's, that's been renewed. Uh, you wait long enough, anything can come back in fashion. Hammer Damage, Unit 5, and Chai Pig now find themselves playing the role of proto-punk forebearers, Local legends spoken about with respect, even by kids who have never seen them live. I, I guess you define legend by your own era, and whatever legend that occurred in your era is going to be the legend that, against which all future legends will have to be measured, and none of them will ever hold up. That's the way human nature is. So there was a legend about the time that Devo was here that's not exactly the same as reality. And then there was a legend about the era of the bank that's not a, exactly reality. Thinking back about the legend of the bank, Ethington remembers a day when he got a very clear picture of what the reality was as he saw the club in the light of day. I kind of go up and I'm like looking around and I think like, God, this place is disgusting. It's hideous. I mean, when there's hundreds of people in there and there's music and everything's great, it was like really cool. You know, it's an elegant almost. You know, but I'm looking, I'm like, you know, and I, I, I'll never forget. There was this like glass at the bar, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, I was, this is, I was here 
when we left. I drank out of this glass and I'm looking at it and it looked like, I don't know, like an insect colony had taken up life in there or something. And I just thought, I, from that day on, I never drank out of Luxury. any or, or ate off of any plates or, or glasses of that place, you know. But, but it's weird though because it simultaneously was kind of this dump, but at the same time, like I say, it had this sort of, you know, sort of decadent elegance to it, you know, and, and, and like, uh, you know, being, it was, it was literally a former bank, and so you, there were these offices, and there were velvet, and curtains, and, you know, and a balcony on the back, and you could go out, and it was, you know, really, kind of, really neat, and, 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 and uh, uh, just seemed like the coolest place on earth, but yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, it, it's, just, that's why it's the stuff of legend, I think. People in Akron love to think about the music scene from like 1977 to 1983 in a way I haven't experienced in any other city. There's just this sort of obsession with this period of time and sort of this idea that those bands, for whatever reason, should have been more successful than they were. But millions of records or chart hits aren't the only ways to define success in rock and roll. There is so much, especially of post-1970 Akron, that can be talked about in terms of rock and roll that to leave it out leaves out a huge aspect of what of who we are culturally of who we are socially akron probably is one of the only communities where somebody would make a film like this where somebody would say like you know what we need to do we need to make a film about sort of bands from 20 years ago that didn't really make it but they're important here like there's there's a historical significance to this specific city. I mean, that's why we're sitting here with you. It obviously mattered. I mean, we're sitting in a television studio talking about it like, you know, it mattered. So, yeah, I don't get it. I don't know if in a little age, you know, you start realizing the, the you, you know, what you may have taken for granted. So anybody that, like the Rebels and all that, anybody that can, like we get to play, you know, it's another chance for somebody to express art, art and music. If we sat wondering all these years, did they hear us? We know now that they did. For more than half a century, rock music has been a critical part of pop culture, a part of culture that gets no respect as an art form. But maybe part of the art of rock isn't just the compositions but in the power of three chords to elevate the performer and the audience in a way that other music just doesn't. Maybe rock just makes you feel alive with possibility of what could be. I mean, there's gonna be a time when rock music is over, but you know, that it'll, there'll always be people who, I mean, I'll always like it. If, if I'm 70 years old and, you know, rock music is now perceived the way jazz is perceived, which is that it's like this fringe kind of niche idiom for people who uh, have a very specific taste. I mean, I'll be that person. Okay, I admit it. Maybe I take it a little too personally that Hammer Damage, Unit 5, and Chai Pig never sold millions of albums. But after seeing Hammer Damage kicking out the jams for a new generation of fans after 20 years, I agree with Chuck. Maybe only rock and roll, but I like it. You know, it's exciting to see all these old farts get back together again. But I don't know what it means. It just means if you can do it, do it. If you ain't dead, play. <laughs>